welcome to the episode of Bottling Wine. To my right, we have five gallons of Concord wine that I made last year. I picked my own grapes somewhere in October and I fermented it in open fermentation and then I bulk aged it in this carboy. It spent most of its time in the garage where it's cool between 45 and 52 degrees that's called cold crashing. And the reason why I do that is so the tartaric acid crystals will, will precipitate out of the wine and fall to the bottom. And that has been accomplished. It's been bulk aged. So now what I'm going to do is bottle it. And I'm going to show you the equipment that I use to bottle it. I bottle my wine differently than most people because uh, I don't sit down and drink a full bottle of wine and when my wife and I have a bottle of wine we still wouldn't be able to finish a full bottle of wine because we don't drink a lot. I make a lot but I don't drink a lot. So therefore it kind of stacks up. So uh, what works better for us is I use uh, used beer bottles. I try to get the kind that have the clear glass so if I decant it and there's sediments at the bottom, I can tilt it back as soon as it starts to run through. And the reason why I decant our wine like that is not to make it taste better because it tastes good without having to breathe. Um, but I don't pressure filter anything. This thing has been naturally clarified, which means most of what's the sediments that would have been in here have precipitated out and fall into the bottom. And what I'll do is when I take the wine from here to put it into a bottling bucket is I'll use a siphon that'll keep itself about that much from the bottom so I won't take what's at the bottom and put it into the bottling bucket. So therefore most of the particles are out. But after this ages one or two years you will see some it will look like dust at the bottom of the bottle. Uh, and that's because it hasn't been pressure filtered or clarified with any kind of chemicals. Uh, that's not the way I like to make my wines. I like my wines to be full bodied, full of flavor. And when you start pressure filtering your wine, you're going to lose flavor. There's no way around it because you're taking away some of the particles that actually carry your flavor. So this is the way I do it. And different people have different preferences. Some people like a very thin, light wine. And that's fine because that's what they like and everybody should do what they like and that's the nice thing about doing it yourself and that's why this is called do-it-yourself living and gardening is because I do get to do things the way I like to and I do it myself so that's what you're gonna see today and just to kinda of show you a little bit what this is this is glass I don't use plastic um, so this is called carboy it has a, um, a handle here that I put on, but you would never use this handle to carry this thing when there's liquid in it. This is only for carrying it when it's empty, so it's easier to clean. So when you're cleaning it, you can hold it here and it's safer in case you hit something and this thing shatters, which has happened to some people. So you gotta be careful. And this is called a bung that holds the uh, airlock. I use the old-fashioned type of airlock and when I put this in the garage just in case it might get freezing in there I put vodka in for the airlock and then it'll have a cap at the top but I also take in rubber band uh, something at the top either a piece of cloth or a paper towel in this case it's paper towel because little fruit flies can make it through the cap because the cap has to be able to breathe so there's little holes in it and they get in there and they drown in the water and then they start to, um, to rot and get fungus and I just don't like that anywhere close to my wine you want this thing protected this is why I have the little cap on here with the paper towel so next I'll show you what the crystals look like at the bottom and then I'm going to bring you over to a table that'll have all the equipment that I'm going to be using to bottle my wine. 
Now I back sweeten my wine and what that means is you add a thick sugar syrup to the wine and when you do that you're going to have to use uh, a chemical to keep this from re-fermenting because even though it's it's clarified the yeasts are supposedly dead there'll be a little bit of yeast in there that might survive and it'll re-ferment you don't want that to happen in your bottle so use potassium sorbate which is used in a lot of foods all over it's basically a food additive for preserving and uh, I'll show you that later on so for now I'll grab the camera and show you the, the crystals and the equipment here we have our carboy and I'm going to bring it down and hopefully this will focus And that is the crystals. Sometimes you can see them kind of shine. Now, this isn't actually that thick of crystals. It's sticking to the edge. They're only maybe uh, 16th, eighth of an inch deep in there, but they kind of cling along this edge just because of the way the curvature of the carboy bottom is. And that's what we're going to be leaving in the carboy. We're going to siphon the wine out from that. And here we have the equipment. This is called a bottling bucket. It has measurements on there so you know how much wine or beer, if you use this for beer, that you have in the bucket. And you need that. You need to know that so you know how many bottles to have and how much uh, potassium sorbate or if you're using potassium metabisulfite that you have to put in there. So that's the bottling bucket. It has a spigot here. These are notorious for breaking right around where it meets the uh, pail. So you always should have a spare. I wish they'd make these out of metal but they don't. They're really made cheaply and this can be a really sticky situation I should say a wet situation if that decides to crack while you're bottling and I've had that happen before it's not a fun day this is what I use this is a siphon with, with tubing this piece here will go inside here and you pump it while it's in the carboy and the, the wine will come out and go into the bottling bucket which is actually lower than the carboy and you want to have your caps because I'm using beer bottles if you're using wine bottles you would have your corks and this is what I use to make sure when I back sweeten it that it doesn't start to ferment again and this red contraption here is what holds my bottles after they've been washed, sanitized, and drained. They'll be put upside down in here to finish draining, and then I can just remove them as I need them to bottle. Moving around, we have the brushes smaller brush is when you're washing out the bottles before you sanitize them the larger brush which is shaped like an L is to wash the carboy afterwards this is a big paddle for stirring if you're putting in your chemicals or uh, the sugar syrup so you can stir it and that also will be sanitized anything that needs to be sanitized will be put into the bucket I put that in there. I put in my um, siphon, my tubing, and this will be filled with bleach water. And it'll be set for 30 minutes with the stuff in there. And what it does is it sanitizes the inside of the bucket and the equipment you'll be using at the same time. And that makes it a whole lot easier. Obviously, you can't sanitize your bottles in there. But after 30 minutes, what you do is then 
using that spigot, you fill up your bottles with this bleach water and then you let those set for half an hour. Then those are sanitized. And from there, they get the bleach water gets dumped out and then you use this tool, which is a pressure washer, which goes onto your sink faucet. First you need an adapter like that and then this screws onto the adapter. This sticks up and it'll have pressure on it from the water in the spigot and when you put the bottle over the top of this end it'll push this wire down and it'll spray and rinse out your bottle. And this hose here will also screw onto that adapter and that's for washing out your carboy. Now there's two pieces missing here that I'll go get right now and show you, which I neglected to put out. Okay, we're back with the two pieces. This is my capper. What you would do is you would place the crown cap on top of the bottle, then you place this over the top of the cap, then with two hands you push down and it would seal the cap onto the bottle. You can buy a stand model where it has one lever and you stick the bottle under but this is the one that I got years ago and it works fine. And this is what you test the the wine as far as the specific gravity and uh, that's important so you know how much to back sweeten it and when you're fermenting uh, what the starting gravity is and the ending gravity so you can figure out the alcohol content or how much uh, sugar you might need to add before fermentation um, because if your fruit that you're using does not have enough sugar to bring the alcohol content up to about 11 percent then your wine will not last and if you want to make a strong wine, then you need to know how much uh, sugar to add before fermentation so you can achieve that level. But for me today, I'll be taking a specific gravity reading of the wine before I back sweeten, and I record that, and then I'll begin to back sweeten. As I go along, I'll be checking this gauge right here. because this will float in the wine and the level, top level of the wine will come up and that's where you take your reading. And I already know what I want that specific gravity reading to be for the sweetness of wine that I'm going to be making. And today my wine will be turned into a dessert wine. And a dessert wine is very sweet. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I have a lot of Concord grapes. I have a lot of Concord wine. So I have dry, I have semi-dry, I have semi-sweet, and I have some sweet. Uh, but this is going to be a really super sweet. It's going to be a dessert wine uh, for those people that really like sweet wine, and sometimes we do. So this one's going to be turned into that. And uh, I'll need to know where that specific gravity is because I've already got it in my mind where I'm going to want the level to be. So the next thing I'll be doing is taking my empty bottles out of the cases, bringing them over into the sink and using uh, a solution of water and regular just soap and soaking them. I soak them for about 10-15 minutes and then I use the bottle brush I wash them out, dump out soap water back into the sink, and then I rinse them three times to make sure the soap is out. Then they get put onto the counter. And once that is done, then they'll get filled up with the bleach water from here. And I'll also be filling this up with bleach water to sanitize my equipment. And it's very important that this stuff gets sanitized not sterilized, sanitized. Uh, because if you get wild bacteria or wild yeast in here, even though you might add 
the chemicals. Um, you stand to ruin your wine. You, you really don't want that. So clean, 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 and you'll be fine. You don't have to be paranoid uh, to the point where it makes you nervous. Just do the best you can and move on. So when I get to a point when I can show you more as far as this process, then I'll continue with the video. Here I am filling up the bottling bucket with water and I use that tubing that I showed you that I use also for cleaning out the carboy. And there you see a silver adapter so this can screw onto it. And I'm putting in regular cold water. You don't need hot water for this. And there it is, it's filling up. Now I'll be adding my bleach and I'll stir it with the paddle, then I'll leave the paddle in. Then I'll add the other pieces in, the other tubing and the siphon into the bottling bucket. Now one thing I want to mention is when you fill up your sink and use your dish soap to wash your bottles, look on the label of your dish soap. And if it says not to be used with bleach, then you shouldn't be using it because we're going to be using a lot of bleach today and if that soap gets down into the drain and the bleach and it doesn't flush out you could get some fumes to come up there will it be enough to kill you I doubt it but if you can do things the right way then try to do things the right way so now I'll leave you again so I can get the bleach in here and continue the process There we are with our bottling bucket full of bleach water. And I have the equipment that I need to sanitize submerged in it. Now when you put your tubing in there, put in one end and then just feed it down so the air can come out of the tubing. So then when the, the far end that you have in your hand goes in, there's no air and therefore it'll be completely sanitized. And this is the absolute easiest way to clean these things. You get your bottling bucket sanitized, all your equipment sanitized, and then you can use the bleach water to sanitize your bottles. It is so simple. Some people try to make this process complicated. It really isn't. So I've got a little bit of work to do here. I gotta slide this over and I gotta get my bottles in with the soap water get them cleaned. Now when I wash the bottles I use room temperature water with with the dish soap. Don't put too much dish soap in. You'll have to rinse those bottles ten times to get the soap out. So enough soap to clean them um, but don't go overboard with it so that you, you can at least get them rinsed out in, in three passes. And I like to uh, soak my bottles in here for one that the outside gets cleaned as well as the inside um, now when I put my bottles away I rinse them three times before I put them away well, I rinse them three times and then I put them upside down in the drain until they're dry and then I put them downstairs in the basement in a case but little bugs can crawl in there um, and sometimes somebody will try to help me by taking empty bottles and bringing them down the basement for me without rinsing them and then you get you know the stuff at the bottom of the the bottle and I can't stress enough keep your bottles clean when when you after you're done serving your wine rinse it three times put it upside down the drain then the next day bring it down and you won't have to scrub these things now I will scrub them anyway with a bottling brush just in case um, then I'll rinse them there's the bottles being soaked so those will stay in there well, 10 15 minutes and uh, that way anything that might be stuck to the outside like let's say you're having a party and you had dip and 
and somebody grabbed the bottle but we don't drink out of these bottles I, I pour I pour it out into a decanter and then I pour it into wine glasses so I rarely have to run into that but this little extra precaution is good and uh, soaks the inside of the bottle just in case there's any residue so they'll be prepped for the bleach water now you should wear clean work clothes when you do this because you could get bleach on you and ruin your good clothes so it's kind of a little bit of a recommendation a little heads up there not for this dish soap but for the next stage with the bleach okay here we go with the next section of this video we have our bottling bucket there full of bleach water we still have our equipment sanitizing in there they're very well sanitized I could pull them out but there's no reason to just leave them in there it's just easier so you take your bottle that's been washed and thoroughly rinsed set it at the bottom of the spigot and you turn the spigot on you fill it right up to the top and set it on on the counter again Just get near the top, you kind of slow it down, and there you go. So I'm doing this while the second set of bottles are soaking in the soap water. So I'm having a couple of jobs overlap. That's all there is to it. This is the easiest way to sanitize your bottles. Uh, very easy. Uh, I try to incorporate and overlap different processes if I can to save time save materials resources and that's why we're doing this this way today just using the one bottle bucket sanitizing everything from this bucket makes it easy now once these are all all full and, and put on the counter I'll leave them there for about 30 minutes from the first ones that I started and then I'll rinse them out using that pressure rinser that I showed you earlier Oh, I should mention one thing that's missing that I, that's normally here when I do bottling, and that's the music. Um, because there's copyright issues with YouTube, I can't be playing music in the background while I'm working. Normally I do that, especially when I'm bottling, because uh, this is, this is a really kind of tedious work. Um, most of what you do when you're bottling is, is cleaning and sanitizing. So it's not the most fun job in the world. So I always have music playing. Um, but once I shut the camera off, I turn the music back on. So I'll see you a little bit for the next step. We have all the bottles filled with bleach water. It's been a half an hour. And now what I'll do is I'll rinse them out very well. And I put this adapter on the faucet because that's what's going to put a big stream of water through these bottles after I empty them out, clean out any of the bleach water. It's very important to do this. And this is when I use the water at its hottest. So when I go to do these, since these will be the first bottles, I'm going to let the first one run for a while until I know the water's hot. So I'll dump these out in the sink. Then you put the bottle over the top and just push down. You see the water rushes out. And then I'll wait until the water is running hot. And that's it. And I do two at a time. Move the bottle around, twist it around, make sure the spray gets everywhere. And now these bottles will get put onto that bottle rack upside down so they'll finish draining. Okay, the bottles are on the rack and we're going to start the next phase here. 
what I have in this pot is 10 cups of sugar and 3 cups of water. This is not the same of a, as a uh, simple syrup, which is either 2 to 1 or a 1 to 1 uh, correlation between the sugar and the water. You want this thing super sugary. Um, and what I'm doing right now is just letting the water and the sugar set together. I'll mix it a little bit, but I'll wait to heat it until I'm ready to use it. And the reason for that is once this gets hot um, and melts together, once you cut the flame, when it starts to cool, it's going to start to uh, crystallize. Uh, now, as when I do, when I cook this, I'm not really cooking it. When I warm it up so it's dissolved, you only warm it up until it's just dissolved. You don't sit there and boil this uh, this syrup because then it's going to get caramelized. So you want it just to the point where it's it's melted. You cut the flame and then you use it right away, and that'll be just just at the uh, boiling point of water. Uh, it will warm up your wine a little bit, but that's fine. It's okay. Um, it won't hurt it at all. So that's the next phase that I'm going to do is to uh, stir this to start the uh, melting process, but without the heat. And then the next step is going to be when I siphon the wine into the bottling bucket. So right now I need to rinse out the bottling bucket and the equipment, the hoses and the siphon and the um, hydrometer so those are ready to be used and then we'll be siphoning this wine. We're back at the carboy with the wine and I want to show you what it looks like in the staging. Down below is our bottling bucket. The spigot is turned sideways and it's shut off. You always want to make sure of that before you start. And I have my carboy tilted. There's just a little tiny stick behind it to kind of lean it forward a little bit. And the reason for that is when I stick the siphoning wand down there, I will try to put it toward the front at the bottom uh, so I can get the most wine as possible so the wine isn't setting flat as it gets toward the bottom. So the next step is going to be siphoning this wine out. And what I will generally do is I'll siphon a little bit out into a pot. And that's to make sure I'm blowing out the uh, water that's in the uh, siphon. Here we go folks, we're going to be siphoning this wine. I'll show you sticking it in. You don't want to go all the way to the bottom right away. You want to keep the bottom of your siphon somewhere in the middle and just let the wine come down slowly. And then when you start getting near the bottom, then you can lower it down. And that's just to make sure you don't stir up the bottom while you're siphoning. Down about halfway. And I'm going to hand this off to somebody to get the blow off. What I'll do is I'll work this pump up and down on the siphon until the wine starts to flow through the tube. If you do it too early, you'll have to do it again. Okay, that's a solid stream now. It's blown out. I'll grab the bottom of the hose pinched off with my finger, then lower it into the bucket. Now we just wait. As you see, the wine level is going down. It's going into the bucket. Try not to disturb the carboy, if at all possible, because you'll see as it's coming down, there's going to be sediments that have stuck along the side of the, the glass as well as the tartaric crystals. So we want to try to keep that the wine as cold or as uh, the wine as calm as possible. 
Mm, smells amazing. And this is the first time this carboy has been open since probably the beginning of November. And we're now at the end of April. So it's been bulk aging for a while, clarifying naturally. I do have a larger siphon where this would go faster, but I found it goes too fast. At this point, you don't want to introduce oxygen to this to keep away from oxidization. So the hose is at the bottom of the bucket. So when the wine comes out, the wine's coming out underneath the wine above it. Now it is exposed to air. You know, you are going to get exposed to some air. You're not going to get away from that completely. And some people, when they, before they bottle their wine, they'll degas it with a degas wand. What that does is take the CO2 out of the wine so you don't have wine that's bubbly. I don't have to do that in this case because it's been bulk aged for so long, it degasses naturally. And this wine coming out of here is absolutely dry, but it's not going to taste like the dry wines you'll get at the wine store. The reason being is I don't add extra tannins. Now for my Concord red wine, I do ferment it on the skins and the pulp and the seeds. And then I'll transfer it to a secondary before it's completely finished fermenting. And that gives me just enough tannins. A lot of recipes will have you add tannins, depending on the type of fruit or whatever you're using, to give it a little bit more mouthfeel. But I don't like too much tannin. So I find that the tannins are just right for me, and because this is a do-it-yourself, and I do it myself, I do it the way I like it. So when people come to drink my wine, they're not going to drink wine that tastes like wine from a a winery or even the uh, the wine store it's gonna taste like my wine my house wine and as you notice as that wine keeps going down I'm easing this wand down and I'll stop for a minute because I do not want to disrupt the sediments at the bottom Now, if I get a little bit of sediments in there, that's okay. Um, I'm just trying to do as best as I can without being too paranoid. A little bit of sediment isn't going to hurt. And when it's split across 55 bottles, you won't notice it. Now, over time, there will still be a little bit of settling, even in the, the bottle that I bottle it in. Now I'm going to ease that down into the front corner. And that will remain steady. As the wine approaches the bottom, the back is going to slowly move forward, but it's going to leave the sediments behind. And that's why I use one of these smaller, thinner siphoning wands. Because if it went too fast, it would, would pull the sediments with it. And just before it hits the end of the wand, I'll pull this out abruptly so I don't get any sediments, because you get like a sucking motion. It's like a vacuum. So I got to catch it just right. And that's when I put on my glasses. And 
and there's no sediments coming up, which is good. If you age it, if you put in your carboy to age too soon before you've allowed it to settle out in your secondary fermenter, you'll have problems at this stage because you'll have too much sediment at the bottom. It'll get sucked in. This is kind of like watching paint dry. But once it gets near the end, then you really got to pay attention. That's when I'll grab the hose, grab the wand, because I want to pull this out as cleanly as I can. And then I'll let whatever's in these, the wand Drain out into the pail. I'm getting close now. And that's it. Slowly pull the hose out of the pail. Then once it's drained, I set that back in there. And then I just shove this in so it's not going all over the place, dripping. And I'll clean that later. You can see all the sediments in the bottom. I'll try to see if I can focus in on that. Those are the sediments, and now we're going to do our next phase, and right to our right, that's where that sugar has been dissolving in a little bit of water, and I'll turn the flame on to that so I can begin back sweetening it. Now once I leave the camera here, I'm going to go over and bring this bucket over to a table, and I'll take a specific gravity reading. All right, so we have our wine in our bucket. And I'm going to take and turn the uh, spigot downward and slightly at an angle. And I'll put a little bit of the wine into a glass so it kind of flushes out if there's any water in there. And there it is there. Crystally clear. Very nice. Yum, that is crazy good. So now I got my hydrometer here. That the vessel is going in, and the hydrometer that floats up and down. I'm going to fill this up to see what my specific gravity is. And try not to let it go in too fast because it'll foam. Then it's very difficult to get the reading. And this has been sanitized. And that's because I'll be dumping this back in. Set it on the table where it's level so your hydrometer stays centered. Get your reading glasses out, unless you're young and don't need one. And then you take your reading. There's a little bit of foam in there, so sometimes you can just kind of pop it down, spin it, this one's not cooperating, and then it gets stuck to the side with the foam, so you really try to stay away from that foam.
and you write down start and the specific gravity Point nine nine six. So our specific gravity is at zero point nine nine six, and we're going to raise it up to somewhere around one point zero five zero, which would mean. this would float up right about there because once you get the sugar in there the density increases it'll push this thing up so for now I'm gonna dump this back into the bucket and I can do that because I sanitize this vessel if I didn't want to dump it in I wouldn't need to I could just drink it so now I have to wait for that sugar water to come up and melt so while I'm waiting I have me a small glass of wine well that glass of wine was so good I decided I'm gonna bottle at least 12 dry because I'm sure somebody's gonna want to taste what the 2020 year was like for my home wine if it's a person who likes dry wine. So I can't forget about them. So what we'll do is now fill up a bottle with wine. You do that very slowly. You don't want to introduce oxygen. Now, some people at this point might want to use an extension onto this spigot. But I don't. I just go slow. And the reason why I don't is because I want absolutely no airhead on this, or at least a minimal one. And if you use a long tube at the end of this thing, when you pull a tube out, then you've got airspace at the top. And the key here is to eliminate oxygen. So you're going to want this thing right at the top. I mean, there's probably an eighth of an inch there of air gap. And what that'll do for you is deprive the wine from oxygen. So it's quite literally impossible for this thing to oxidize. We might be introducing a little bit of oxygen when we bottle. But I've been doing this for many, many years, and this works extremely well. And I've tried a lot of different ways of doing this stuff. And I'll let them set for a minute before I put the cap on because you get little, little foam bubbles there. And this is a little bit tedious. Um, but at this stage of this whole process, you know, I've had a little bit of the wine. It's all good. It's the cleaning part that I don't like. This is a good part. Because I get the taste as I'm back sweetening it. And I make sure I always have a little bit of wine while I'm bottling. Then there's always a little bit left at the end. So the slower you can fill this bottle, the better. And I'll do four at a time. And I've got the spigot angled, and I've got the bottle angled. So it's running down the side. It's not just pouring right down the middle of the bottle. That would create a lot of foam. So it's a little bit about technique at this point.
And it doesn't matter that it takes a little while to bottle because, like I say, there's plenty of wine around. So now we go to the next step. We take our bottle of wine. We put a crown cap on it. And I always check to make sure there's no debris in the crown cap. Some people will sanitize these with an acid. You used to be able to uh, boil them, and, uh, or at least put them in uh, water that had just had been boiled and then cut the flame and stick them in. But they started to cheap out with the plastic seals that are inside these and the things would warp. So now you can't heat them up. And I don't like using the, the acid sanitizer because acid and metal, it's not a good combination. So I take them out of the bag, I inspect them to make sure they look good. And this wine has a lot of alcohol in it, so I'm not worried about sanitizing them. You put this over the top after the cap is on, and you pull down till it pops. And there you have it. And you can't even see where the wine is there at the top. You really don't want any airspace there. And this wine will last you for decades. This is not like corks. A lot of people will cork their wine. And even the wineries are going away from re real cork. And what cork does, it slowly oxidizes your wine because it is like a wood material. It's basically the bark of a tree, which means it's semi-porous. So oxygen will slowly get in there and will start to change that wine. When you have a crown cap on this thing with a seal, there's nothing going to get in there. Uh, so your, your wine, chances of this thing oxidizing are extremely low or getting any kind of bacteria in there. Now, where that may not be such a good thing is when some of these wineries actually age their wine in bottles with corks to purposely slowly oxidize it to get a certain flavor. I don't particularly like those wines, so um, I, I don't even attempt to do that. Uh, some of the wineries in New York State have switched over to a plastic cork, so it will last longer. Other wineries are just skipping that and say, let's, let's go to the screw caps. These things basically last forever. And it used to be you know, back in the 70s, if you bought a bottle of wine that had a screw cap, it was cheap wine and it was terrible wine and it was just wine you used to get drunk. But not anymore. If you see wine with a screw cap, it doesn't mean it's a cheap wine. It just means that they're switching over because technology uh, and science tells them that these screw caps are actually better than the old corks. So, um, and with this type of crown cap, It'll basically be there forever. So now the next thing I'll be doing is getting that sugar water finished heating up. And um, then I'll pour that in the bucket, stir it around with it real good, take a taste, take specific gravity reading, and I go back and forth and back and forth until I get it right. Now if the acidity that's in this wine isn't high enough to take a dessert wine with high sugar content, then I may add an acid blend in there, which is made for wine. It's to preserve the mouthfeel so it doesn't taste like just flat juice, because uh, you don't want that either. So I'll finish capping these. I'm going to bottle probably 12 bottles of the dry, and then I'll move on to the sweetening. And I'll need to look on the side of the bucket there, kind of see how much uh, wine I'll have left for the sweetening, just so I can kind of know how much sweetener I'm going to put in there. I bottled 18 bottles of the dry wine, a little more than I initially thought I would because it is very, it's an exceptional wine this year and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who come to visit that like dry wine that would want to have some of that. So now I'm going to move on to back sweetening and I just have the sugar syrup just at the right point where it's clarified and not boiling. So I'll pour some in, I'll swirl it up, and then I'll do a specific gravity reading. I'm not sure if you can see that, but that's what it looks like. And this isn't real scientific, folks. 
Um, what I'll do is I'll get the wine moving, stirring it, and while it's moving, then I'll pour this in. Not all of it. And I'll keep it moving. And it will mix very readily. Then I'll pour some in my little vase here. And I'll pour it back out. I want to flush what was in the spigot before. Then I'll slowly fill this up to get our new reading. We're not even close yet. So I'll pour that back in. Remember, this has been sanitized, so I can do that. I'll start the wine back swirling again. And I'll pour more of the syrup in. You really don't want to let this syrup set because it'll crust over. It's high concentration of sugar. You also don't want to keep it warm on the stove because it'll caramelize. So you have to do this fairly quickly. Again, we're flushing out the spigot. And we're getting closer. As you see, This hydrometer is rising. We're at 1.030. We want to be at 1.050. Looks like we're going to be using almost all, if not all, of that syrup I made. That's why you back sweeten before you add your preservative, because you need to know exactly what, how much you get in there because the preservative is based on volume. It's not based on the specific gravity. And we just keep repeating the process. Flush it out. Point zero four four, getting real close. Now at this point, I'm actually going to taste some because I say I'm going to put it at one point zero five zero, but that's just kind of a guesstimate.
pretty good. I think I might stop there. Now remember, you can always add more sugar, but you can't take it out. And that's why I'm stopping where I did to taste this to see if I like it. So now what I'll do is I'll go ask management if they like it. Be right back. Well, management's not putting a stake in the ground. Um, she said it's up to me. It can never be too sweet for her. So what I might do is go a distance on this one and make it a little more sweet. I mean, it's sweet. I mean, it's right up there. But I want this to be the sweetest uh, red dessert wine that I have. So in order to do that, I'm going to push the envelope a little bit. But I think I might have to put a little acid blend in, just kind of keep the mouth feel. So that's where we're going with this. Well, that's all the syrup I have, so this is going to be good enough. Not real scientific, but when you do it yourself, you can do whatever you like. And I can assure you this is going to be sweet. So we got to flush the spigot. Swirl it around one more time to make sure everything's incorporated. Now, some of you may think I'm ruining the wine, but it's not if you like it. Okay, so. I'm just above my goal at 0 0.052. Boy, that was pretty close in my rough calculations there. So, let's see what I got. This is it. Still has good bouquet. It's not too sweet, but I'd like a little bit more acidity. So next step is for me to add a little bit of acid blend. So what I have here is a quarter teaspoon of acid blend with some water that had been pre-boiled and the, the glass heated up first. Now, since there's so much acid in here, uh, I'm not going to worry about contamination at all. And the water is still kind of steamy. So I'm going to pour this in and then stir it, let it set for five minutes, and then um, stir it again, run the spigot through, stir it again, and then test it again. Um, because you've got to let this acid kind of get incorporated. And that's why it's in water. It comes in a powder form. So you put it in the water and you stir it, and then you dump it in. Uh, some people might want to use the wine itself, but some of these additives that you put in will not dissolve well in wine, but they will in water. So that's what I'm going to do now, is I'm going to pour this in, stir it up, and I'll keep doing this until I get it right. And remember, go slowly with this. You can put more in, but you can't take it out. Okay, what I used in this batch was 
about three quarters of a teaspoon of acid blend that was dissolved in water and then stirred in and it really turned it around. Um, when it was at 0 0.044 uh, the relationship between the acid and the sugar was was fine but I was really wanting to push the envelope with the uh, the sweetness and when I went to 1.052 it started to fall a little flat. Now I know that because I've been doing this for quite some time. That's why I added a little bit of acid blend. And it's uh, basically a blend of citric acid, uh, malic acid, and one other. And it's specifically made for wine. And um, so this is the result. And man management signed off on it. She said it was very, very good. So I got it dialed in right. So what I'll do now is I'll put the potassium sorbate in. And this will be also dissolved in water and then mixed in. And this, this really does have to be specific. And that's why you should have one of these bottling pails that has the measurements. Because we're right now we're at four gallons, and this says one half teaspoon per gallon, and you really want to follow the directions with this stuff, um, and this will keep this wine tasting as good as it is right now, and it'll stop it from fermenting. Sometimes I've noticed it will not stop it from fermenting 100%. So you may get like a 5% fermentation, which gives you a little bit of bubbles in your wine. And I actually hope that happens because I absolutely love my wine that way. Uh, someday I'm going to uh, learn how to harness the uh, making um, bubbly wine. Um, can't call it champagne because it doesn't come from the champagne reason, region. Or they call it sparkling wine. Um, that's a little bit more scientific and a little bit more exacting on what you have to do. So for now, I'll just go with you know the regular wine and hope that maybe this doesn't quite do the job and leaves a little bit of residual yeast there to give me a little few bubbles. Now I could say, well, I could just cut back on this and let that go. But we don't want to make grenades either because if you get them in a bottle and they begin to ferment in the bottle, that bottle will explode. So you don't want to you don't want to push the envelope. You just hope that maybe you know this will give you just you know we'll keep away most of the fermentation not all but if if there's a little bit in there, then that's a bonus for me. And I do have one or two wines in the basement where that happened. But that was mostly when I was using ale yeast for wine. For whatever reason, I, I, ale yeast, which is for beer, will kind of hibernate and resist this stuff. And after like one year, maybe two years, you'll get a little bit of fizziness. And boy, that is really good, especially in my apple wines. And that's when it becomes private stock. Um, I don't give those away. If somebody wants to taste it when they're here, I have some, I'll give them some. Um, but I really like that. And in regards to this wine now, the way it tastes, it tastes exceptionally good. However, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and I can taste the acid blend, which is normal when you first are using it and putting it in the bucket. Some people wouldn't notice that, but I do because I taste these things. You know, it's kind of like um, a cook tasting what they're cooking. They add a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And if you put too much of one thing, you know, they can taste it. And I didn't put too much of one thing in here. However, I do know it's there and I can taste it. Now, that's why you wouldn't take a wine like this and serve it right away. Because one, you've back sweetened it and two, you've added an acid blend. You gotta wait for the chemical reactions to occur in this, in this wine, in the bottle. It'll change 
A month from now, it'll be different. Six months from now, you'll never be able to detect this acid blend at all. And that sugar syrup you put in here will have blended with the wine 100%. And you will have a wine that is just exceptional. But you gotta let it age. You gotta let the chemical reactions work between the sugars and the acids and the tannins and everything in there. And you'll get a very exceptional wine. But when you back sweeten like this, and especially if you back sweeten and add a little bit of acid blend, you gotta let it age a little bit. So be patient. But that's why you have your wines from the prior years, because you can continue to drink those while this is aging on the shelf. So that concludes the uh, bottling wine uh, uh, episode here. I hope you enjoyed it. Maybe you learned some stuff. Maybe you'll want to make some wine too. Now this fall, I'll actually be making more wine. I plan on making a black currant wine and a cherry wine from sour cherries. I'll also be doing another Concord. However, the Concord wine that I'll be making will be turned into vinegar. Now, I did that last year, but I didn't raise the alcohol content enough. So in my opinion, and if you ask management, um, their opinion will be different. I should say her opinion will be different. In my opinion, it's not acidic enough. So in order to get more acidity, you got to raise the alcohol content, which means I'll have to add a little sugar, more sugar to it when I ferment it. Um, and then I'll get a little bit more acidity for my taste. But as far as Concord wine, I won't be making any for drinking. So as far as uh, wines made by me this fall, uh, by my own plants, that'll be the black currants. I might squeak in an elderberry, but that is not a real simple wine to make. Black currant is easy. And it clarifies incredibly fast. But elderberry wine, very tedious, those little berries. And uh, you got to heat them up first, just a certain temperature to make sure you don't have the, the toxins still um, alive there. And you have to dilute it just right. And then it leaves a residue on your pails. And you have to use oil to get it off. And then you have to sanitize it after that. And then you want to make sure it's aged a little bit in the plastic. So when you put in a carboy, you don't get the stuff stuck to your glass. So elderberry wine is not for the faint at heart. But blackcurrant, very, very easy. And cherry, I make my cherry completely different than anybody else. My cherry will taste like cherries. Uh, you go to some of these, these uh, wineries and they'll make cherry wine and they'll use these cherry flavorings in it and it tastes like oh, it tastes like crap to be honest with you um, so I've never had a cherry wine as good as what I could make here because I fermented on the skins and the pulp and um, it's a completely different wine uh, it's very very good I make it kind of like a, an open fermented grape wine and and that's what I do differently than than most people is I open ferment um, requires a little bit more work and a little bit more caution in what you're doing. But once you get it dialed in, wow, it, you know, all the, the off flavors come out as it's fermenting. It's not stuck in the carboy with, you know, when you got an airlock on it and the oxygen is getting to the yeast so the yeast can act and work very quickly. Uh, now, it will ferment faster, and some people say, well, the faster some, the wine ferments, then the, the worse it is. You know, don't listen to what people say and what they write on the Internet. Try it yourself. Do it yourself. And then figure out if, if it's good or bad. Because if you don't push the envelope a little bit, if you don't try things, if you just go by what people say on the Internet or in books even, then you will never learn how to make things the way you really want them. I'm sure there's some people that would have this wine here and say, oh boy, this is cheap, awful wine. For me, it doesn't get better than this because I made it exactly the way I like. 
Uh, so I don't let people tell me what I'm supposed to like and what I'm not supposed to like. Uh, some of these expensive wines, I've tasted them, and they're just horrible, horrible wines. I don't know why people would spend $200 on a bottle of wine, and I wouldn't even give you a nickel for it. Um, so I make my own now. And uh, over the years, I've made some mistakes. I've learned quite a bit as things progressed. And now I can make my wines the way I like them, and they came they come out exceptional. Um, so that's the plan. It's possible I could make some peach wine or plum wine. Uh, the climate change really messes me up with the stone fruit. Um, we have a, an, an environment now where I can actually grow plums and peaches, and I've actually created my own plants that do well here but what happens is you'll get a big warm spell in the spring and it really causes everything to come out bud out and blossom then all of a sudden you're down into the 20s Fahrenheit and it kills your blossom buds and last night we had one of those nights it snowed three inches I thought it was just an inch until I looked on something flat that wasn't on the ground and it showed three inches but by the time I was out and about in the yard, there was only one inch left on everything. And I looked, I have a uh, thermometer that records minimum temperatures, and it got down to 27.1. And man, that's not good. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been running into this, and those cold temperature snaps are just ruining my blossom buds. So it remains to be seen. I have a lot of blossoms out there. The last, I should say, I have a lot of uh, blossom buds on my peaches and my plums. And I even have a special tree out there. It's a Chinese apricot, which is also called a Japanese plum for making Japanese plum wine. And it's loaded with blossoms. Uh, but last year it had blossoms, not as many as this year. And a snow and a freeze just killed them off. And I'm afraid last night they may have been killed off again. So before I go on running on too long I should probably conclude this this episode because I'll be talking about these plants and making wine later on in the year so for for now thanks for joining me I hope you can get into making things yourself do it yourself and enjoy the growing season